Coming up, the musical genius of Laura Ortman. She's taken the art of playing the violin to a different level. We'll catch up with her in France. Plus, legal and cultural barriers that hinder tribes' ability to protect sacred lands that are not on their reservations. I'm Patty Tawahungba. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tawahungva. In South Lake Tahoe, California, the mandatory evacuation order is now downgraded to a warning for the city limits. Just a week ago, tens of thousands of people were forced to leave the area due to the Calder fire. That blaze started three weeks ago and has burned more than 216,000 acres. Cal Fire says it's also destroyed more than 900 structures and another 27,000 are still in danger of burning. Meeks Bay Resort, which is operated by the Washoe Tribe, is in the danger zone. On its website, visitors will see a posting that says the resort will remain closed until September 17th to comply with the U.S. Forest Service closures. According to Cal Fire, the Calder Fire is now 48% contained. An educator in New Mexico steps down after pressure from the Pueblo and other tribal leaders. Rachel Gugel was the director of the Legislative Education Study Committee, a highly influential position in state government. We reported a few weeks ago that she was accused of making disparaging comments about Native culture and education. The All Pueblo Council of Governors led the effort to remove her. The chairman, Wilfred Herrera Jr., issued a statement that read in part, Now it's time to find a new person, someone who has the lived experience, who values the linguistic and cultural diversity in our state, and who can help shape education policies and programs that respond to the needs and the rights of our Native children. The statement went on to say Gujel's racist attitude shows the institutional racism that exists in New Mexico's political and educational systems. Tribal leaders say they were dismayed at how state lawmakers refused to tackle explicit and implicit racial biases and perpetuated the status quo. The council says the drawn-out process that led to Gujel's resignation shows just how far New Mexico is from achieving equity for all students. An update on the shocking story of a male nurse who raped a permanently incapacitated woman in Phoenix. The woman is a citizen of the San Carlos Apache tribe. She was a patient at Hacienda Healthcare Center for 26 years. Nathan Sutherland, her former nurse, pled guilty last Thursday to sexually assaulting her three years ago. He also pled guilty to a charge of abuse of a vulnerable adult. Staff say they had no idea the woman was pregnant until she went into labor. Her family says she delivered her son while severely dehydrated and without any pain medication. Sutherland was fired by the facility after the incident and has since given up his nursing license. Nearly all of the executive leadership of the facility have also been fired or have resigned. In a statement, the facility's chief executive said, We have cooperated in every way possible with law enforcement and investigators, and now we hope the judge will sentence Sutherland appropriately given the severity of his crimes. Sutherland's plea agreement calls for a sentence between five and 10 years in prison and lifetime probation. A judge will formally sentence him in early November. The University of Arizona is naming a new endowment fund for native graduate students in honor of a tribal leader who fought for water rights. The announcement was made during the annual conference of the Water Resources Research Center. We are establishing this uh, Rodney Blaine Lewis Scholars Award to support graduate students who are enrolled members of an Arizona Indian tribe and who are enrolled in a program of study in water law, 
policy or a closely related field. Lewis passed away in 2018. He was a citizen of the Gila River Indian community. The conference focused on tribal water rights and included insights from native water professionals, as well as cultural and tribal leaders, like the chairwoman of the Colorado River Indian tribes. Emilia Flores says water policies need to be updated and brought into the 21st century. Pharrell Williams, the award-winning musician, is finding ways for indigenous communities to use his platform. The goal is to have tribes share their own culture and ways of life in the world. This year, Pharrell collaborated with a native artist from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Together, they released a sneaker called the Human Race Sikona. To read more about this, visit our website, IndianCountryToday.com, and search for the headline, Pharrell DJ Two Bears Collaborate on Adidas Sikona Sneaker. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholahungva. Coming up, an extensive series on sacred sites in the Arizona Republic will meet the author of that series. And later, Laura Ortman grew up around music. We'll find out how she plays the violin today. Laura Ortman grew up around music and musicians. She loved being in an orchestra and feeling the synchronicity of everyone playing together. She's classically trained to play the violin, and in her career, she's produced music that defies traditional classic violin parts. Laura Ortman joins us today to share more of her music with us. Welcome, Laura. Good evening. Good evening, because you are in where? Tell us where you're coming from. Greetings uh, from the south of France. Um, I've been here um, for a month for an artist residency for uh, music composition um, uh, through the Camargo Foundation. Um, and today, tonight is my last night. Um, so I have to move out and go back to New York tomorrow. Well, we're so thrilled to have you joining us from France and uh, in such a prestigious home there today. Um, but you are White Mountain Apache, and growing up, did you know about the Apache violin, or when did you learn about the Apache violin? Well, um, Jula Kappa. Um, does everybody know Jula Kappa? <laughs> Everyone knows Jula Kappa. Yeah. Okay. He's a funny yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, my, that's my dear friend. He helped um, connect me with my family. So he, he and I and his whole family became really close. And then I was leaving after one visit and he was like, hold on one second. He came back with his Apache violin. And he's like, I can't play this. I think you could. <laughs> and he's like, because we've been through so much, you know, with um, our, our family um, generations and, and, and um, grow, growing together and stuff like that. It, it, it changed my life. So I, I play the Apache violin um, with, with, with all my heart. Thank you. 
And you actually got to meet um, Chelsea Win Win uh, Wilson, who was the Apache man. Chesley, Chesley, that's right. That, that was many years ago. That was in New York City. Um, he was at the Museum of American Indian. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just got to meet him and shake his hand, you know? <laughs> just just being amazed, you know? And, and then um, he, he was in this old, um, I guess it was an old uh, uh, um, uh, advertisement for Wrangler jeans, like in a National Geographic, probably in the 70s or 80s. And he's there like holding the, his Apache fiddle um, and some Wranglers and of course a Western shirt way with a desert background in, in, in the distance. And I saw that and I was just like, this is, this is inspo, inspiration. And, and so I, I, um, I uh, tried to mirror that aspect of him playing the Apache violin with a big vista in the background um, with this video that I made with Nanaba Becker um, and Jock Soto, where we had Jock dressed up in jeans and a Western shirt with my Apache violin um, with the New York City skyline in the background, so. All these kind of things tell their own stories together in different generations and ways. So. I've seen that video too, and, um, and the music is incredible. Um, you were raised away from your people, from your tribe, and yet you ended up playing an instrument that um, they were known for. Is that kind of, how, how do you describe that? Is that uh, meant to be? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've, I've played the violin for 40 years now. Um, um, my, uh, my, my Ortman grandma, uh, my Hummer grandma, she played the violin. So, um, and I always wanted to be like her because she always had a constant smile on her face and was super talented. And um, it's just, it's kind of just my size, you know? <laughs> um, and, and it was just like a true inspiration. I loved music and I, um, I liked, I liked to be able to, to play when I don't have the words for how I, how I am um, responding or, or taking it in the world. So, so yeah, I mean, all, all kinds of string instruments like that, that are my size. <laughs> um, <laughs> fits <to me. laughs> How would you describe your music? Because, you know, I, I was thinking as I was listening to your music, um, you know, how much, how much Mozart do you play and how much Laura do you play? Yeah, I, I was trained classically, and then you know that, that was a long time ago. Um, I, I um, I've been doing um, collaborations with um, other indigenous artists, um, dancers, storytellers, um, poets. Um, I mean, I, I I try and collaborate with other people just to kind of break out of any kind of like um, like normal violin duh, duh, like snooty tradition kind of things <laughs> because you know I, i'm given this opportunity to, to work with some really really wonderful um artists so it's only fair if we kind of meet um in our own ways together instead of like hey i'm a classical violin you know, I'm, I'm not a classical violinist anymore um i i uh i've um embarrassed myself out of that a long time ago. <laughs> Somehow I doubt that, but, you know, when you are, when you're performing, you know, it looks like maybe you're talking, it may be you're singing, maybe even shouting. What are you doing when you're playing? Um, well, when I play, I mostly can't see. Um, I'll, I'll start out with a vision um, and I, I just, you know, I'm stunned and, I, and I'm always trying to think about what, what kind of story or atmosphere we're trying to create. Um, we as in the music and, and the audience, the listener and the recording. And I mean, they're, they're, the sky's the limit. It's just like this kind of atmosphere, never ending place um, that I go to when, when I play. Um, um, so 
I mean, I, I would say mostly that that with with the violin, it's like an extension of my body. <laughs> you know, it's it's made of things very dear to me, like pine wood and and, and you know gut strings and horse hair and you know it's just it's just a beautiful instrument. There's there's uh, tree rosin all over the front of it and stuff. So it, it, it helps me tell, um, gives that grit in there of where I am um, talking about things that I really am concerned and care about. I think you're itching to play for us. So go ahead and give us a, a little bit of taste of Laura Ortman. <laughs> Live from France. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Th this place reminds me a lot of Arizona. There's like um, crazy canyon type structures that drop into the Mediterranean Sea and the water is medicinal like everywhere and 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 there's um just just there's cactus and agave and um the food is all sun-kissed and it just means a lot to me so here we go Amazing. You took me from to, from the Choya cactus all the way up to the pines, and I can see the river. Just beautiful, Laura. Oh, uh, thanks. That goes out to, to you, and thank, thank you so much for inviting me to um, um, speak with you from, from here. It, it's really a special place, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget this month I've had here. Um, Oh, and so fantastic. I'm looking forward to come back to New York and in my community and, and um, just keep on going and tell more stories. <laughs> Very good. Well, Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. This is so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll stay in touch. Okay, Patty. Love you. I <laughs> love you too. And when we come back, we'll take a look at a new series on the issue of sacred sites and the laws that prevent tribes from protecting them. Indigenous people have made the desert their home for thousands of years. Sacred sites dot the landscape, but not all are controlled by tribal nations. One example is the Blythe Intaglio, or as the Colorado River Indian tribes call them, the Sleeping Giants. They are on the lands controlled by the Bureau of Land Management. Deb Kroll is the Indigenous Affairs reporter for the Arizona Republic. She wrote about the site and others in a series called Indigenous People Find Legal Cultural Barriers to Protect Sacred Spaces Off Tribal Lands. Welcome, Deb. Hi, thanks for having me on. 
So, Deb, you have written a series of articles, six of them for the Arizona Republic, about lands that tribes uh, have sacred sites on but no control over because of land jurisdiction. Talk a little bit about the Colorado River Indian tribes and the sleeping giants that you wrote about. Well, the Blythe and Talios are the most well-known of nearly 200 of these of these what scientists call geoglyphs, which are large figures inscribed upon the, the desert floor. As we know, the lower Colorado River Valley doesn't get a lot of rain and, and the climate doesn't change much. So, so these figures have endured for somewhere up to about 1400 years now. And give our viewers a sense of how large they are. The, the largest one at the, at the public site, the Blythe and Talios, it, which is about 15 miles north of, of the town of Blythe, is about 171 feet long or tall. I mean, these are huge constructions. Even the smallest one at, at the public site is about 30 feet. And so you really can't see them when you're just looking from the ground, but you actually were able to get uh, aerial footage of the images and they're extraordinary. Uh, who was, obviously the native people there knew about them. They have stories about them, but um, there was a pilot who actually saw them for the first time, a non-native person. Yeah, uh, the, there was the first time a non-native person saw them was in the 1930s when he was flying a mail plane from one place to another. And that, of course, attracted a lot of public in, of public attention to, to the Intaglios. People kept visiting them over the years, and then finally they were put on, on the natural, National Register, and then Bureau of Land Management finally had to take things in hand and erect the fences around it and enact some other protections to keep them from being vandalized. The day that we were out there, there was you know, some people who actually decided to create their own geoglyphs by scraping away the, the mahogany patinaed rocks to make whatever they were going to make and BLM had to go in and, and repair those. If there's damage done to one of the actual intaglios though, they, they defer to, the, uh, to CRIT to do those. Um, or if it's farther down into ancestral, Quetzon territory, the Quetzons take care of things. So it's all along that, uh, the southern border in Arizona with California. Um, some of them, the tribes that you mentioned, Colorado River Indian tribes, which uh, include the Mojaves. Uh, what are their stories about these images? What do they say they mean? Well, um, Colorado River Indians chairwoman, Amelia Flores, says that, that a lot of the stories have been lost because our oral histories didn't get transmitted possibly due to you know the upheavals of the you know, settlers to coming to Arizona and California um, loss of language probably the boarding school culture had something to do with it but what they do know is that they're they do hold great cultural and in some cases spiritual significance because generally nearby there are prayer circles inscribed. There are other uh, trails that lead to them through the desert. There, there's, there's so much significance there. And perhaps someday some, someone from one of the tribes will find someone who remembers. Well, this is a, a fascinating series that you've written here. And um, someone, so much border on that freedom of religion aspect with tribes. After completing this series, and people can go online and, and we'll have a link to your stories on our website as well. But after looking at these uh, uh, situations, these cases, and talking to tribal leaders, have any of them expressed whether or not natives truly have freedom of religion? If, if you talk, talk to a, a tribal cultural practitioner, a tribal leader, anyone who has anything to do with, with traditional tribal culture, the answer would have to be no. The going clear back to 1493, when when the Pope issued a papal decree or bull, which purported to give all of the Americas to the Christian crown heads of Europe, Native people have experienced all sorts of barriers in protecting 
in protecting and practicing our various religions, including, including removal of people from, from spiritual sites. We have the Code of Indian Offenses in the late 1800s. We have the boarding school culture. We have the, the California mission system. We have Christian missionaries. There's all sorts of things that have come into play to restrict and, and keep Native people from practicing their religions. And our research indicates that the federal laws that were put in place are inadequate to do the job because they're not enforceable. They're simply procedural laws, which say, well, if it's nice and it's convenient to, uh, to protect a, a site, then, then let's do it. Not even NAGPRA protects a site. All it does is, is allow the tribe to come and reclaim ancestral burials and, and significant cultural objects. They, it doesn't allow them to leave them in situ if that's, if that's what they prefer. All right. Well, there's so much to unpack here, but we'll leave it here. And again, we'll put a link up to your series on our website. Deb Kroll with the Arizona Republic. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. And thank you for watching. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Tawahungva. Join us again tomorrow. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.